five. <coughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, excuse me. I, I was just choking on myself. I guess that happens. <laughs> welcome to You Be the Judge every Wednesday at 6 p.m. I'm one of your co-hosts, Dr. Paul Dyer, and we have Marilyn Pierre, who's running for Circuit Court Judge in Montgomery County in Maryland. Maryland is a state, yes. And for those you don't know, we have Judge Claudia Barber, who's also one of our co-hosts. We meet every Wednesday here to talk about things that you care about. You Be the Judge is actually about information, understanding, and action. We talk about legal issues, we talk about stuff going around the world, and we talk about a lot of stuff going on in Maryland because that is where a lot of people are. And we have great guests, great interviews, and it's just about information. Here's the thing, people. What's going on in Maryland, what's going on in a county, the county, or many counties, it's probably going on where you live, too. It's about your investigations, about your climbing in, digging in, and being part of a process that cares about people. There's a lot of things that's going on in many states that it seems to take more people out of it and put more policies in. It seems to put more procedures in and takes more people out. We need to hear what you're going through so we can talk this over and maybe we can have some legal issues because we have some great legal minds here. Marilyn Pierre is an attorney. We have Will is just uh, an attorney himself. We just have some great legal minds. That's why it's called You Be the Judge. It's not about what we judge others. It's about how we gather information, how we can come to a collective decision and say, hey, you know, this doesn't sound right. This is not right. And here's the legal precedence that they have come across. Marilyn, how you been this week? Oh, I've been doing well. You know, the weather has been really, really nice over here. And it's a beautiful day. People are in the holiday spirit. So I find them to be kinder than they've been in the past. So I have been doing really, really well. How about you? How have you been doing? I, I, I'm not doing so well. Holidays doesn't do oh. doesn't do well for me. Um, I've always. And why is that? Well, I've always been not a by humbug, but I remember times when I was away from home. And I Mm -hmm. remember times never having to be around my children, being in the military, being away from people you love. You get used to it, which is sad because you shouldn't get used to things that you love. But we miss, we, we don't have, and yet we still must carry on. And with COVID and the thing that happened last year when COVID first hit, and now we have the Omicron. We are going into a deficit of depression, and people are going to take their lives, drink more, be more abusive, and that's, that saddens me because I have family members that have COVID right now that's been tested positive, and, oh, sorry. I, and I won't be able to see them, and I, and I believe they'll be okay, but that, it's not being able to see them if able to see them. It's not being able to be around someone you love because of certain circumstances, certain issues. So we're facing that as the Omicron takes more people out of commission of being part of a commission, being part of a family. And that saddens me. Yeah, it's sad, but there are reasons to be optimistic as well. Last year, we didn't have anything that we know of in terms of right. things that could mitigate the symptoms of COVID. And I heard today that the FDA has approved uh, the, the Pfizer pill yes. for people who already started having COVID. So we're making progress, not as much as we would like to make, but the train is headed in the right direction. I, I just wish another thing is not wish is that why haven't we had test kits in the beginning and for families. I understand they're giving it out at certain places, firehouses, police stations, health clinics, and things like that. And then being part of the Red Cross, I know there's health clinics that has test kits that you can get home, but they're only giving two. We should have been able to have test kits at home since seven months in COVID. We could have had test kits. 
Because everyone needs to know where they stand instead of standing on a line or paying. I hear numbers are going up in around different states and people are paying over $200 to get tested. Now, so if they're going to start charging people in certain areas around the country or certain areas around Maryland, not everyone can afford $200 to be tested. That's unfair. So now we're we're excluding people again, not on purpose, but economically. So it does sound like it's on purpose. So that's a, like a, is, is is that a legal issue? Can you you is, you're not saying you can't get it, but you're saying you can't get it if you can't afford it. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with leadership. And we talked about that before. Yeah. You have certain leaders who, you know, they just don't know how to lead. <laughs> uh, okay. and, and then don't forget that our own governor tested positive for COVID recently. So he is being quarantining. <laughs> you know, he's quarantining himself, I should say. And that is actually a step forward because our leader this time of year tested positive for COVID and he still went out into the, you know, well, he still went out and was campaigning and doing all kinds of things. And he did not let people know that he had COVID. So who knows what was the result of that? Um, I would just like to ask, was he already vaccinated? I mean, because the leaders- No, because the vaccine- Everybody else to- get vaccinated so you would think that he was already vaccinated you're talking oh about you mean governor, governor Hogan? Hogan? yeah i think he's vaccinated and boosted yeah mm, okay. but see that's what people I, I think that's one of the things that we need to talk about more just because you vaccinated and boosted doesn't right. mean that you can't get COVID. they said that you just get a milder version a milder or version. um and especially somebody like him don't forget he's a two-time survivor uh, of cancer wow yeah, and so he is definitely high risk. So I would imagine that they would take all the precautions that they need uh, for him. And even with all of that, he still got COVID, uh, which means that we have to be extra careful not to get it, not to pass it. And you could have it and not have symptoms. You could, and, and they were talking uh, today on the radio about how you could be positive <laughs> in one test and take another test and not be positive. And they right. talk about how you could be shedding the the, um, the COVID, what, what did they call cells? Yeah, how you could be shedding the COVID cells, which is why you could take a test today and be positive and take a test tomorrow and not be positive. Which is why test <laughs> kits are so important. I think we should, I mean, where do we stand online to get all this test? Because once someone gets a negative test, they're going to be like, okay, bam, I'm out, you know, and these tests are, you know, they're doing the best they can. Are they doing the best they can? I think, though, that's questionable. I still think we have to protect ourselves, protect loved ones, and protect family. And we know that the Omicron is highly contagious. You may not get as sick, but it, it is transferable in a more... So now... Are we heading towards a shutdown? Because we shut down, people are shutting off. People will definitely, and, I, and it goes back to that depression thing I'm talking about. If we go into a shutdown or right. we start taking away things, the Baltimore City mayor just shut down things for kids. Like no sports till January 30th or something. And the kids are the less transmittable. They, they get sick less. So all these kids in Baltimore who have less to do now have even more less to do. So now they're back on the streets doing whatever. It's, so now you're creating an epidemic of depression. We need to create a way to not create more depression. Well, that's true. And we should be cognizant of that. Uh, some of the things in the courthouses are shutting down as well because mm. some cases that used to be in person now are going to be virtual. And it's all in the hope <laughs> that this virus would not spread as much. I'm wondering whether the schools are going to be in person after the holidays, because you have winter um, now. Actually, yeah, today is the winter solstice. Yes, solstice, right? Yeah, today's the winter solstice. So you have winter, which is 
a very good season for COVID. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have families getting together from different areas of the country, which is also an issue. So to send those kids back again to college when they are, when they've been around people who were not vaccinated and so on and so forth, I'm not sure it would be responsible of the schools to tell you the truth. And I'm not saying that just because I want my daughter to remain <laughs> after the holidays. And I don't there want to do. there it is. Remaining after the holidays. There it is. And we and we have our other co-host, Judge Claudia Barber. Welcome, Judge. How you doing? You on mute. <laughs> doing well, doing well. Just listening. So uh. we have uh, a guest. So now I, I, I'm glad we were able to wait. I don't know if uh, Ms. Cooper is available right now. Um, She's still here. Yeah. So you, Miss Cooper, go ahead. You can introduce yourself because I know she wanted to do that. Uh, is she ready? Do you think she's ready? Oh, she's hugging someone. Yeah, oh. You never stop a hug. <laughs> Don't stop hugs. Everyone <laughs> hug everyone. Thank you. They told me don't stop hugging her. <laughs> they see me hugging you. Well, good evening again. Well, Ms. Cooper, I do want to welcome you to You Be The Judge, and I do want to let everybody know you can get all this on all your podcast channels. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can put on Bridges Live, and you will get You Be The Judge. So wherever okay. you're picking up all your podcasts, you can do that. You can also go on my YouTube channel and all the social media. Um, so welcome, Ms. Cooper, to You Be The Judge. Thank you. Well, go ahead. You, you, like you have me the spotlight. To introduce Please myself? introduce okay. yourself. Thank you. I am Ms. Melody S. Cooper, the mother of my son, now deceased, Kwamina Akron, which was murdered um, 348 days ago by the unlawful officers of Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland, which is in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we're... Well, would you like me to go from here? Well, please tell us about what you do know about the situation that happened with your son and, and just give us the facts that you know. Okay. I know that they preyed on my child. Um, one of the unlawful officers had someone go and get my son and say, let's go to the store. But my son never made it out of the complex in which was opposite of what they um, announced. Initially, when they first um, executed him, they stated that he was running across 355 on a Friday afternoon during rush hour from the police station to the Chelsea Park complex, which everyone knows four people are not going to run across 355 at any time, especially a Friday during rush hour traffic. He was actually ambushed at the front of the complex after the young guy told him, let's go to the store. He ran off and left those three officers to, to chase him back to the back of the, the um, complex because he had walked to the front of the complex. Once he got into the back of the complex, one of the unlawful officers decided to get out of the car and um, opened up, fired and striking my son in his back and he um, died instantly. He went face down and then they proceeded to turn him over. The statements to the media says that they um, attempted first aid, uh, but they did not. They continued to shoot my child in the groin area while having him laying there for seven and a half hours so that they could power wash the area and set a scene to try and make it look like he was carrying a gun and he was trying to shoot at them. But after they went to the grand jury and the prosecutor stated that that firearm that was next to his hand had not been shot. Um, there was no gun residue on my son's hand. The only residue was on my son was on his chest from when they stood over top of him and continued to shoot. And all the bullet casings as the prosecutor um, stated, came from the, I will say, unlawful officers, revolvers, I mean, um, firearm, because they all had automatic weapons. This is, 
I, I, I'm gonna... F first... There is no first. I'm sorry for your, your loss of your son, of your family member, of a human life, right? So... Th there's there's no words that we're we're not we're not I I'm sorry and coming and then hearing this as a as a black man I'm going to take this a little personal so everyone who listens live and listens whatever bear with me I am also very afraid of getting shot by an accident by Someone who thought, perceived something, and it was it would just have to be mistaken. I I'm definitely afraid of it. I there's there's no, I don't live in fear, but you, that doesn't mean I'm not afraid of it. And, and there's a difference to that. So as I speak this. We feel like we're being hunted. And that hunt has been going on since I was been a small boy. And there's a heavy weight that sits right on my head. That I look at younger men who may not have the aptitude, may not have the verbal way with all may not have the situation awareness. So they're even more su subjectable of getting killed, right? And that still doesn't stop even me from being killed, no matter what education I have. It has nothing to do with none of that. A bullet knows no reason to not kill you because you should live over this because of this or that. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, um, this gives us an opportunity to possibly open the door to community policing again. And uh, what it is and what is actually happening. And I was listening actually to another talk show on Sirius XM and one of the talk show hosts was making the point that many people are conditioned mm -hmm. to go negative on black people mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. They're conditioned to think negative, mm -hmm. They're conditioned to police negative. They're conditioned to uh, assume most of the time wrongly negative things about black people, which is why the end result is the majority of the people that are getting convicted, that are, that are found guilty, that are ac accused and those accusations lead to the conviction of people that are black because because you know people in general are conditioned wrongly to assume wrong things about black people and it reminds me partially of the the Thurgood Marshall movie uh which uh, was um what uh, in uh, featuring Chadwick Boseman who played okay. Thurgood right and during one of the voir dire question, questioning of one of the white male uh, jurors was about, you know, do you have any uh, preconceived notions or something of black people? And, and it was summed up so accurately yeah. by that white person because he said they generally are connected or, or um uh, they do bad things. <laughs> that was his assessment. Yeah, because that's what they do. That's what, yeah. And and, and that was his thought. Mm -hmm. That was his thought. He knows nothing about nothing. But, you know, uh, black people do bad things. Right. Now, that's automatically out the box before he even go in the jury room. Right. 
He's thought that way, you know, and that's where you will get a, a strong chorus of retired police officers who will tell you the truth that there is racism in policing. Well, we, we, we know that. I, and I'm, I, I am, I'm, I'm drawing a line, you know, the, the line in the sand. Those who do not believe there isn't racism in police force, please inbox me at drpaulwdyer.gmail.com or call me. I am curious why you might not think so. I am, would love to hear all your sentiments about why you don't think there isn't racism in the police force. The other thing which you said, Judge Claudia Barbara, is that this, my drill sergeant told me one thing that sticks with me forever. He told me a lot of things that stick with me. During inspection, I'm going to find something because I'm looking for it. You, there's, there's nothing, you're never going to pass an inspection because I will find something because I'm looking for it. So those people who are looking at black people to probably do something wrong, they're going to catch them speeding. They're going to catch them doing things because you look at them harder. And oh, yeah. Now, that's that's definitely the case. Even right. if you examine um, Marilyn Mosby, Baltimore City State's attorney, Marilyn oh, Mosby. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, you know, people should also recognize the bias in media that uh, people people don't talk about. Or maybe it's the elephant in the room. But, uh, you know, I started noticing, which is why, I, you know, I don't even subscribe to the Baltimore Sun anymore. But I started noticing how they write their stories. Uh, they always take internal audit reports from Baltimore City. It's got to be Baltimore City, you know. And they've got to pinpoint the errors in that report and magnify them. Okay. So that the story can read Baltimore City Housing Department, Inspector General, uh, you know, internal audit report discovered, mm -hmm. you know, this is wrong with Baltimore City and that is wrong with Baltimore City and this is wrong with Baltimore City. And, you know, and the school system and, and all of this, you know, now there are internal audit reports and Inspector General reports all over in every single jurisdiction, yep. Carroll County, Howard County, Hartford County, you know, but you're not harping on that. You're harping on Baltimore City. Oh, intentionally, okay. which, which, which is a point that needs to be made. But I want to go back to Ms. Cooper because I, I wanted us to understand what happened to her son. And Ms. Cooper, if I could just, I guess, give a synopsis of what you talked about. And, you know, I, and I don't um, want to, Erica had a question and we'll get back to you, Erica. Well, Erica we'll had get, a question, yeah. but I wanted to give yeah. a synopsis. Oh, yes, thank you, Erica. You had a question, but I wanted to give a synopsis before you ask your question. Because Ms. Cooper has been a new beta judge before. Thank you so much for coming back. And again, we're really, really sorry for your loss. And we are here for you in any way that we can be. But what happened to Ms. Cooper's son was that on January 8th, 2021, four undercover Gaithersburg police officers were waiting outside of her son's house, house. waiting for him to come out. And when he came out, because they were undercover, uh, they, we, we, we're not really sure what happened, except that we know that her son ended up dying. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some witnesses whose stories were different from what the police officers uh, said happened mm -hmm. and uh, the, the the case was sent because this is a Montgomery County case and Mo Montgomery County has a memorandum of understanding um, I'm sorry the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office has a memorandum of understanding with the Howard County State's Attorney's Office to investigate and vice versa so that they investigate each other's uh, police involved shootings and we know that in reference to those sorts of investigations, Howard County has never recommended that a police involved shooting in Montgomery County uh, be tried uh, um, because they, they, they have never found that there was crim criminal behavior in that sort of action. 
And what I would like Ms. Cooper to do after Erica asked her question is to talk about the progress that she has been making in terms of trying to get justice for her son. So Erica, you could ask a question and then Ms. Cooper could talk about what she is doing to try to get justice for her son. Well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I don't, I don't have a question um, per se, but a comment, I guess it's a mixture when we were talking about racism. Um, some of the readings that I have been going over and some individuals I've been speaking about, one of the things that I mentioned and was kind of echoed was racism is considered and should, if not a public health issue, because racism causes us to go into certain types of mental health and issues that we already have and experience as Black individuals. So as it pertains to police officers, I'm just hoping that at some point that the governors and the persons that oversee policing um, will take more of an integrity approach to it, not just a political approach. Because as we know, racism causes lots of issues within our communities, disparities, number one, but then also, too, within the police department, as we're speaking about Mrs. Cooper's son and all the many other individuals, unfortunately, these cops, the police officers, they're not being held accountable, as you just mentioned, even with the parameters of Howard County investigating for another, you know, (laughs) for uh, Gaithersburg. It's like, it's just time for for our officials and our leaders to really, really hold and hold the officers accountable or their supervisors accountable because we hold parents accountable. We're holding homeowners accountable. We're holding the citizens accountable. Um, But in the same token, we're not holding the individuals who are supposed to be protecting and serving. And I just think it's overdue. And we talk about this all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact is we are we're going to talk until we're blue in the face until something is done. And the fact is things need to be implemented. Training needs to be implemented more than the training they're getting. It needs to be clear. Uh, security clearances need to be a little bit more in depth with the officers. I know it costs more money, but these are the things I just believe needs to be implemented within the officers um, interview processes and reevaluations. Um, whether it be psychological and things like that, because this is getting extremely out of hand. This is not new for us, and it's unfortunate. Um, And I just hope that at some point in time, we will see that racism is contributing to the public health um, issues that are going on within our community and our nation. So, and I want to let you talk, Ms. Cooper, but here's the crazy thing. Erica's a communist, right? That's exactly what those words will be thrown at you or thrown at me, or thrown at someone who said exactly what you said, you're a communist. And it, 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 it boggles the mind how people weaponize words so it dismisses you and, your, and the content and the context of what you just said. That bothers me. Ms. Cooper? There's, how is, how have you been thus far with getting what you need and getting things done? You know, with the power washing of the sidewalk, there's a lot of this evidence that bothers me about why isn't that an issue? Well, um, I don't know why the grand jury saw it fit to state that those officers did not commit a crime when the prosecutor himself told me he had a list of charges ready to indict. But because he works under Richard Gibson, the state's attorney over at Ellicott City Mm -hmm. um, County, over that Howard County courthouse that he had to... uh, follow what his boss instructed him to do. So attorneys online, ring the bell, please. Someone explain to me when you have a list of things that you want to bring a prosecution, that doesn't mean it's valid or doesn't mean explain. Can you ladies explain this to me or someone? Well, (laughs) 
In this situation, I'm assuming it was an assistant state's attorney who told Ms. Cooper that there were charges that he wanted to bring against those police officers. Okay. However, his boss, who makes the final determination, okay. according to what Ms. Cooper is saying, is saying, no, we're not, we're not charging anything. And in this situation, it's not even, well, you might not even consider it a race issue because the state's attorney in Howard County is a black man. Mm-hmm. And the police officers, all four undercover police officers were what we would call Caucasian, Ms. Cooper? Except for Delgado, Sergeant Delgado, the one that decided to open fire and that sat in the parking lot five hours and sent the young man, well, not the young man, sent his um, agent or CI or snitch in to lure my son out so he could murder him. So this is what I'm finding out, though. Again, this is all about the power of the state's attorney's office. Yep. Because it has everything to do with them making calls. And to the extent that we as citizens vote in state's attorneys, you know, we have the power. Do we know that, right? Do we know that? Do people know that? I hope I hope they do. I, hope I really they do. hope they do. Every county has a state's attorney, including Baltimore City, and we also have an, a Maryland attorney general. Okay, so the state's attorneys in particular, they pay they play a key role here. You know, they can say up or down uh, whether or not the charges will be brought or not be brought. That, uh, just like that, that, just like in the January 6th incident, as I've said over and over and over right. again, they had an arsenal <laughs> of charges to bring against all of them. Right, right. All of them. There were there were killings. And see, nobody's been charged with felony murder. So how 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 can that be? So how that's I think that's really pushes us civilians that who are non attorneys, not even on TV. That we don't understand why, when you have a charge that could be brought, but the state's attorney says, "Well, I'm not going to use that," and then, so how was that? Po- like, well, there's a variety of things to consider okay. there. Okay. okay, so some of the things they consider is, you know, how difficult is it going to be be for me to prove that particular uh, charge. Okay. You know, and I have to go through the elements of the charge to determine what I what facts I have to really match up with that particular charge. And uh, uh, there also is a mindset, and I will say it at least, uh, that they look at, at police cases very differently than they do civilians. Because I was going to say, I know someone who got charged because they were in the area. I know That's someone what I'm who got a charge because they were in the area of a gunfight. And, and see, this is where I think that when you're dealing with um, knowledge and voters, it's very, very important to encourage uh, community organizations to have candidate forums, especially state attorneys candidate forums, you know, uh, and mayor candidate forums. And... Um, other candidate forums that forces the candidates to answer questions about, you know, prosecution of police officers and uh, taking a stance against false police reports made by Karen, people that exhibit Karen behavior and cause people to be arrested unnecessarily. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we should be asking directly those questions to the candidates so we understand where they're coming from. So Ms. Cooper, so that we're not surprised after they get into office right. that they're not going to do nothing. So what did the state's attorney say to you, Ms. Cooper? What has he said? Well, basically, um, I did have a meeting with him in October with myself and my attorney. OK. And I had a couple of questions for him and each question he did not give me a direct answer um basically i asked why did my son lay out there on the ground for seven and a half hours and he says well it's not like we were trying to set a scene because anyone that knows and he put up his right hand 
the, this would be the side that looks at things in a realistic way that people that don't have uh, emotional attachments like you do. And then this would be the side of the people like you that said that there was a narrative that I'm giving you a narrative, but the people in reality will say that the police didn't have time to set a scene because there were officers that arrived on the scene that did have body cameras. So <clears throat> my question was, why did my son lay out there on the ground for seven and a half hours? Because if it was just one victim or deceased um, or assailant laying out um, a deceased, it usually takes three to five hours for, the, for them to investigate the crime scene, not seven and a half. I've even had that statement from um, my private investigator, which is Mr. Keith Quick, a retired top-notch detective, homicide detective out of Philadelphia. And he states in all his years of working in law enforcement, he's never heard of, of, of he said, a corpse of a person laying out there for that long of time once the coroner gets there, they're removed. Can, can, so, I, 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 hold on. I, I, I got a question for Marilyn and Judge Claudia Barber, and, and for any other attorney on the line. Can you charge a person that's been shot if they were going to give him a charge? Is that is that can that be is that possible? Like her son got shot, and see, they said he stole something, and they find whatever he stole on him. Can he still be charged with? Do you understand my question? Does that make sense? I I understand the question is, and the answer is yes. There has to be the will, though. In in these situations, there is a lack of will, which is why uh, Maryland law changed as of October first with the with the law enforcement bill of rights. There's uh, the investigations now go to the attorney, attorney general's General. office. Yeah. So so the attorney general's office from this day forward in Maryland will be investigating it, uh, investigating these sorts of incidents. We don't know yet whether that is going to be a big change because even though uh, the investigations would be done by the attorney general's office and all of the uh, police involved shootings, the investigators that they're using are police officers <laughs> on the, of our Maryland state police officers. So. We don't know, but who knows? I, one of the things that Miss Cooper could do is to, well, not to give you advice or anything, but <laughs> I guess a, a, a suggestion, uh, because I, I hear that the Attorney General's office can be convinced in some situations to, to look at cases that occurred prior to October 1st. So I don't, I don't know if this is one of the things that you have done, Miss Cooper. Well, basically, I have um, <clears throat> written letters to the Attorney General, um, Department of Justice, um, President Biden, but I did get a response from the the DOJ um, in October in reference to the letter that was written in August prior to the grand jury hearing, and they stated to me that whatever section and code that was, they didn't see where the officers committed a crime. <clears throat> and if I could bring more evidence or present more information for them to investigate, um, then they would see it fit to do so. If I got more pertinent information, I guess the, the first letter was a little bit vague. And um, like I stated to the uh, Mr. I'm not going to call him Mr. Richard Gibson, that they did not present all the evidence to the grand jury in order to have a fair hearing. And his response was, we presented all the evidence that your attorney gave us. And um, it's okay, your wait, attorney. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's my thought on, on what you just said. Have you made 
Maryland Public Information Act requests, uh, and this is my thinking. I think if you know of a retired police officer, I think that you should have a conversation with a retired police officer and ask that police office, that retired police officer to assist you in preparing Maryland Public Information Act requests uh, against the state's attorney's office and specifically ask for videos, cameras, policies uh, for, ter- for not using cameras and get responses from those offices. Now, the reason why I said you should use a retired police officer because a retired law enforcement person knows all the different uh, uh, intricacies of these law enforcement officers. Now, you may make a blanket request and ask for one piece of information and they may have that information stored in 10 different locations and in 10 different systems and in 10 different categories or in, you know, and they won't give it to you because, oh, that was in the internal affairs file or that was in the something, something, something else file. And you have no clue because you're not a law enforcement person and you don't know how they accumulate their files. So I'm confused as to why the state's attorney would tell you uh, it's based on what your attorney gave you. That's, that well, is, is that confusing. was, yes, that's the, that man said. And then my next question to him was, um, before the grand jury uh, hearing, ever since my son was murdered, y'all stated that I would receive all the information and evidence and what would be presented in court once the hearing was over. But here it is. I still do not have the police testimonies or the police reports. And police reports at minimum, at minimum. He said to me because he needs to protect the people. And I said, well, what people? I could understand if you were saying the witnesses, but I do have information as to what witness had a small clip that y'all took from their phone y'all gave their name their location everything i said i'm just getting ready to leave because i came here it was a waste of time i don't even live in the state of maryland so he said it did it was not a waste of time because he took time on his busy day to help me and i said well it doesn't seem like you're helping me like you said you're protecting the people you're helping the people well, the see, people that's... versus kwamina offering so so that's that's another concern. Um, it doesn't matter if the police chief is black, blue, white, polka dot, whatever. The question is, what is the also, uh, again, and these elected officials, what is their agenda? Are they about rooting out racism? Or are, are, are they there? Do they see themselves as the police chief to appease and make sure they back up all their supervisors and lieutenants and sergeants and 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 corporals. So you know, regardless of whether they've committed something wrong or right, and, and now, her, if you're gonna root out racism, that's one thing. Her, but if you're not gonna root it out, then I don't know what you're doing there. Her, her son has still not been charged. That's that's kind of goes back to my original question: Has your son been charged with anything? He Kwamina. didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. Right. So yeah, he was. He just was. Kwamina was in a house when they targeted him to be lowered out so that they can execute him. So, so what my point is is that that's why I ask: Can a person be charged after you, you shoot him and say yes because he was going? To, he was this person, right? He hasn't been charged, but yet he's dead, and everyone's okay with that in the <clears> state's <throat> department. That that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't ring well. It, something's not something's not right. You know, if you shoot a person no. and they were a rapist, okay, that's one thing. That's one thing. If there's a warrant out for his arrest. Right. That's another. That's thing. another. Thing. They had enough time. They had an ample amount of time to get a warrant for his arrest. If that officer sat in that parking lot for five hours, because absolutely immediately one of the 
residents that lived at the front of the complex said he saw the three men with hoods approach your son. No, they didn't have any badges. He didn't hear them announce themselves. All he saw was Kwame not turn around and start running. And that's when Delgato got out of that car at the back of the parking lot and went and shot my son. And that witness stated that they thought that Delgato was visiting someone because he was sitting in the parking lot for five hours that Friday. And my son told me Tuesday that the police was trying to murder him. Then Wednesday, he said they were following him. And then Friday, he winds up dead. And um, that Delgato is the one that initiated shooting my son and had the young guy go and lure him out of the house. They had an ample amount of time to issue a search warrant if they said that my son had a gun. But the so-called girlfriend, mother, told me when I went there that the guy that came and asked Quam to go to the store, he said, she said, your son was a good boy. He stayed in the house. He didn't do nothing. He went out to the store to get his food. He would go with his cousin to go to the studio and we'd be back in the house. The boy that came over is known to set people up with guns with those officers to mm. lure your mm-hmm. son out of the house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, I didn't never see again, that lady again, before I, that I, day. I, I, I'm, I'm baffled by how this is still... Okay, say the cops did nothing wrong. But there was no investigation of why this all took place. Like, it just happened. Someone's got shot. They were police officers. Oh, well, let's move on. Well, that, that's you, troublesome. You, it's troublesome. But, you know, see, this is where I fall out with, 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 with everybody. <laughs> I'm just starting to believe nobody. Just nobody. I'm, I'm like, I've had it. I, I'm, I didn't thrown my hands up. I'm like, I don't believe anything anybody tells me because I see some 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 story that just doesn't make sense. Right. You know, because and when you I went one I and asked one for, together to make two, I it's, asked for it's, the, it's appalling. And you go and you want to throw this out and expect the public to believe you and to have trust in law enforcement. I mean, yeah. what I what I see is a bunch of crookedness. I see cover up. I see cover up. I see I see nothing different <coughs> than what we found out about the the Maryland uh chief medical examiner. You know, oh. I, I I don't I you know, not just nothing. You know, I'm like, oh no. You can't tell me nothing. Uh, that that also reminds me. I think last time you were here Miss Miss Cooper, you said that the coroner said you would, I'm sorry, the medical examiner said that you would, uh, it would take them five it's years to give you. Five to six years to get an autopsy. Right. So have you received? And they have some autopsy in the um, information that I obtained. <clears throat> and what did but, the autopsy reveal? Uh, I didn't look at it. Everyone tells me not to look at it because it shows my son on the ground. It shows them saying things, doing things. Taunting is what the um, ex-homicide detective said, that they were standing there taunting Quam while he was dead. And um, That should have been worth some to disciplinary they had the, action right there. They had, they had the audacity to tell me that the the gunshot wounds to his private area was old. I said, no, they weren't. My son was never shot in his private area. And as a matter of fact, when I saw my son's body, those were fresh gunshot wounds. So he was surprised. You saw him? I said, yes, I did. Well, how did you see him? I said, remember, y'all wouldn't let me see him. So the um, people that handled his body before his funeral let me see him as soon as they got his body. So I seen Every hole that went into my son. But see, that that puts them on the defense because now they, they look, you know, they look not credible. You know, you're going to sit there and tell me that those were prior wounds. And then you you acknowledged already that those were fresh wounds. Yes. So that, and that, I just, told that, that just cuts against credibility. But the medical and examiner told- had said that they were taunting. So he actually has... Medical no, evidence. No, not the medical exam. The Mr. Keith Quick, the 
ex-homicide, not ex, retired oh, okay. homicide detective of Philadelphia when he looked at the video because he's writing a, a report in reference to all the inconsistencies of the grand jury hearing and everything that's missing. And what I should forward over to the DOJ since the, I wrote the the first letter was a little bit vague. It wasn't too informative. But now that he was able to, um, what shall I say, examine the grand jury hearing, and he knows the law, but he doesn't know Maryland state law. But I guess to that extent, the law is the law it should be the same everywhere no. when it came to that hearing of um how and why the police reports are still not there, how the police testimonies aren't there. And that's when I was sitting in that Richard Gibson's company and he stated he's trying to protect the people. And I said, the people who, what people? He said, human beings. Don't you know what a human being is? I said, yes, I'm sitting here. Well, so I, I, we're going to, I don't even understand that. And I don't even understand that response. I don't. I there. There's a. I'm. I'm. I'm probably just sitting here getting more upset. Is it? Does anyone have any thoughts? I, How, I just have a question. This is ahead. Teresa. Ahead, Lee. Teresa. I just want to know what is your lawyer doing, and are you comfortable with the legal representation and the legal? No, because after, no. I I learned last week from my private investigator that the attorney and Gibson or frat brothers. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about lawyers though. Um, to get a Ben Crump a, a lawyer for cases of this magnitude, you know, they, it, it well, well that was all, my mistake because Mr. Crump did reach out to me two weeks did. after I retained that other attorney. Um, they called me three days in a row trying to get me to get rid of that person that did nothing i see well i think well you know ben crump is a national rec nationally recognized lawyer and he's a specialist in if i could say that in these types of police brutality cases he can pick up in a hot mini second in a nanosecond what's wrong mm -hmm. in the investigation because he's done so many of them so yes, I mean, I've, I've think that, that the door is not closed on that. But this also goes back to Erica's point about the mental anguish, mm -hmm. because people sometimes have to expend large sums of money getting uh, paying for responses to Freedom of Information Act requests or Maryland Public Information Act requests, and they're hit with bills. Uh, but you know, but you want to see righteous. You want to see. You want to see what went wrong. You want to get to the root of this and the bottom of this, and to get justice. I get that. Uh, but but to go back again to Erica's point, this is a mental toll on people when things like this happen, and you got a a, a shoddy system that's not, um, um, uh, you know, being candid about uh, the investigation. And how your son was killed. Does anyone else have any other comments, questions, or thoughts before? Because it, you know. Well, but since you say that, many times Ben Crump works with local counsel. Yeah. So there's no reason for your lawyer not to work with Ben Crump. So that way, Ben Crump could bring the. He's, he doesn't want to work with him? Um, he didn't want to work with too many of any people because mm -hmm. there was. A uh, Miss Flanagan um, out of California that had five other attorneys in Texas and different states and working with the um, United Nations in reference to Kwamna's case. He did not want to work with them either. Okay. I mean, you I, can, I've got to say that this is a grievous case. Yeah, I, I have to say this is a, well, not just grievous. This is a very grievous case. And we're trying to be sensitive in reference to Ms. Cooper, because we don't want to right. discuss the details of it because we don't need for her to keep hearing over right. and over again right. what has happened. And we want to be as sensitive as well, we can to her. But this is a very, very grievous case when you know all the details involved 
in what happened to her son. And which is why I think you were getting those phone calls from people because when they found out what happened, they really wanted to help. And you know, if if the help is out there, go get the help. You know, hopefully you you could you could arrange some sort of way with you know sometimes well, one, one thing also forward. One yeah, and, but the, don't forget to uh, uh, continue to um, galvanize this social media wise. So that the, so that it's out there and people, you know, what and and I'm alarmed that why bo- body cameras were not um, undercover, um, visible and on. They were yeah, they're they undercover police officers, they, so they're, they're not, not undercover. Smart. They were plain clothes. They're not plain clothes. Undercover. Sorry, okay. yeah, they're and plain then clothes there are, police officers. They have so now not... implemented that all plain clothes in the state of Maryland are to wear body cameras as it stands now. And then also we're working on qualms law, which means that all officers must have a body camera. If you if you're carrying your revolver, you should be wearing a body camera, as well as have your um, badge exposed, just as well as your uh, firearm. Got it. Thank you. But, um, I do appreciate you guys having me back on the show, and Mr. Quick uh, also stated that um, is there any way that I could have my attorney reprimanded because he feels as though that oh, he oh, was working oh, with oh, them and well, not against them. We know you can have attorneys reprimanded because you could just make an accusation that an attorney and it just seems like you end up, you know, just throw it out there. Make an accusation. How do, how do you do that? How do you... Through the attorney's grievance, is that correct? Uh, I know that's one because um, I'm familiar with that. You have Maryland's Attorney Grievance Commission. You have DC Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Uh, but uh, the thing is, is that the focus also, again, should be getting information, getting evidence, getting, you know, to get digging deeper into what happened and how it happened, when it happened, you know, who, you know, who instigated what. Uh, we, we don't know all the answers to that. And, and that seems to be real critical here to better understand how, how your son was killed. Yes, I agree with that. And also, if you're bringing a grievance against an attorney, it, timing is extremely important because you don't want to be seen by other attorneys as somebody who's going to bring a grievance against them. So they might not want to be involved with someone who has already brought a grievance against another lawyer. So be careful with the timing. If you don't like your lawyer, get another one. Part ways and get another one. Yeah, and do what you need to do. And after you get the information that Judge Barber talked about, then you could, then the air will clear (laughs) better and you could do what you need to do to backtrack and take care of things. See, again, sometimes when you're, I'm sorry, to, to yeah, sometimes when you're guessing, you guess wrong. Mm-hmm. And so you don't know everything that's behind why the attorney did what they did. Right. And sometimes you find out more information if you choose to go a different route and get a new attorney. Because uh, then they will, then that new attorney will come back and say, well, that first attorney, attorney did this, this, and this right. It's just that it didn't get to this direction. Right. So that's that's why you know it, you know seeking information is so critically important. And this is still pretty foggy. I just there's, there's not you're you're not clear. I think I think ultimately every parent, loved one, or whomever should have a clear picture, right or wrong, why someone is dead. If that yes. that, that cannot be too much to ask. If someone is dead, for whatever reason, let let's be clear about it. That's it. Let's right. You know. Well, you know, history has already taught us how the police and law enforcement treated Ahmad Arbery's mother. Mm-hmm. History has ha- already taught us how they treated it, how they treated Breonna Taylor's mother. Mm-hmm. They just fed them a bunch of lies. Mm-hmm. I'm just being frank about it. You know. To tell somebody that Ahmad Aubrey may have been involved in a robbery was just a big fat lie, mm-hmm. you know. 
and to say the same thing, uh, you know, with Brianna Taylor, why, you know, why not, why not tell her how she, how she died? Right. Right. Oh, yeah. And also in Montgomery County, there's a hotly contested state's attorney's race. And for those people who aren't in, in the state of Maryland, when we say state's attorney, we mean prosecutor. So yeah, there's a hotly contested state's attorney's race. And have, have you had a chance to speak to all the candidates, including the one in office right now to find out yeah. why, yeah, I would, I would. You know, why this has not moved forward? or what they would do in a situation presented with a situation like yours? Well, I've spoken with um, Senator Hold Ben Cardin. Yes, that's mm -hmm. Senator. I've spoken to, to him. Uh, the only state's attorney that I've spoken with is that Richard Gibson. I've spoken with um, the prosecutor, Chris Sandman. Um, I've spoken with a couple of delegates. And uh, well, like I said, like Marilyn yes, said, no, there's, none, a, there's, uh, a, there's, none, there's sorry, a Maryland none, state's attorney's race going on and contact uh, those people. Well, none of these people that you've spoken to are in Montgomery County. And the only person who could actually bring a case against these police officers is the John state's attorney Carter. from Montgomery County right now, John McCarthy. John McCarthy. He has three people who are trying to unseat him. So you need to speak with him in his office and the other three people who are trying to unseat him. Because if one of them unseat him, then, the, then whoever unseats him could then bring the, um, a case against these four police officers. Yep. <laughs> Well, I know that they have not been released back to work as of yet, and I don't see um, why is that, because if they didn't commit a crime, then generally the officers are right back at work. But since they're still being investigated by internal affairs, that's a sign of guilt. Mm, not really. It, and also the Department of Justice, did they decide that they were going to investigate this case as well? I mean, because like I said, it was so egregious that, you know, they, I, some, they, they, sometimes I think of it. Was, she, she said they said no because of something um, of more detailed more de evidence. Yeah. yeah. So Isn't it their job to investigate and get those detailed evidence? They have an investigative unit. And I, and I don't even understand why they expect your lawyer to come up with the information that they need to figure out whether or not they need to charge. I, well, I think that they, they addressed it to me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this week, I have. Go ahead. Someone has something to say before yeah, we close up. Mrs. Cooper, I've been listening to you and I, I am. My heart is wrenching, you know, from your loss. And what I did hear, though, was that you mentioned that there is actually a Kwame's law that's been established. Is that correct? Um, law they yes. are trying to um, pass that law, Crimes Law. When I went to the House of Assembly back in February, and I had been speaking of since then, I was in favor of Anton's Law, yes. um, police reform, and I invoked Kwamna's Law. I wanted Kwamna's Law. And then in September, I got an email stating from a delegate, Leslie Lopez, and someone from the ALCU, ACLU, ACLU, um, American Civil Liberties Union, yeah. and in bold letters stating Quam's law. So now they're trying to pass Quam's law, in which they stated that it may be between the January fourteenth up to March. The 13th or so, it has to be within a three month window or something to that effect. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything that we can do as citizens to help enact that? Because that is, that, that's Sign important. Sign a petition. Okay. To and testify uh, in the General Assembly uh, uh, yes. when the law come, uh, comes uh, into committee, goes into committee, um, and uh, hearings are held. I would Thank be you. interested in reading what that what actually the wording for that. So it requires that all police officers, whether undercover or plain closed, are required to have a body camera and they're not undercover, 
not uncover, not undercover. Plain clothes and all uniform officers on and off duty when carrying a concealed weapon. Okay. When carrying their service, service revolver? Weapon. Yeah, maybe the service weapon. Yes. Service okay. Weapon. okay. Okay. I like to thank everyone for listening to You Be the Judge every Wednesday. This week is Christmas or the end of a of an era. Or, so I would like to wish everyone a merry, very <laughs> merry Christmas and be safe, be happy. Mm -hmm. um, we will see everyone next week, right before the new year of You Be the Judge. I am Dr. Paul Dyer, Marilyn Pierre, and Judge Claudia Barber. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And everyone, please be safe, be kind, be compassionate. And take care of each other. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you Thank so you. much, everyone. Happy holidays.